they met at a Methodist college in Indiana, married men who thought they wanted to be divinity students, and 25 years later were internationally famous for having created the first hit feminist musical. Welcome to Women in Theater. I'm Linda Weiner, theater critic of Newsday, and our guests are Nancy Ford and Gretchen Cryer, pioneering author stars of I'm Getting My Act Together and Taking It on the Road. They were the first successful female composer lyricist team in theater history. I think they may still be the only one. <laughs> <laughs> don't we think that's true? How sad I is that? Don't know. I don't know. I thought about well, that. I thought about it all last night, trying to think. Mm. It, dare I say that they're still the only ones? And uh, well, Secret Garden was written by Marcia Norman and Lucy Simon. Yes, but I'm talking about an ongoing. Oh, an ongoing. Team. Sure. An ongoing mm -hmm. creative team. Mm -hmm. that well, you that's guys probably right. Have been working <laughs> together for. Mm -hmm. A long time. Yes. A long time. Since we were 18 years old. I actually. love that. So you really, like, let's do a little brief background mm -hmm. because it's not just that you're from the Midwest, but you are like from, you're from a town of 200 people? Yes, but <laughs> Linda, I went to school in a town of 695. That's you because see. they had <laughs> outdoor, they had indoor plumbing That's there, right? That's right. <laughs> and the, yeah. in the school in the town of 200, they had an outdoor, outhouse, and my mother wanted me to go to a place that had indoor plumbing. I love a mother who has high goals <laughs> yes. for her child. <laughs> you know, that was, that was the start, right? That's right, that was. So I knew, you know, the sky's the limit. And you were from we Kalamazoo, had, yeah. which is... And we had indoor and, plumbing. <laughs> yeah, they had, <laughs> yeah boy, both boys and girls' rooms. Aha, uh -huh. well... Uh, and, yeah, Kalamazoo, credit. we had... I think it was a town of about 65,000 when I was growing yeah, up there. And it's larger now. Yes, yes Gretchen yes. thought I was from a big city. I did. And so you guys were in the same dorm? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's how we met. And you were a music student. Mm -hmm. And you were I was English. in English literature, yes. And you were already starting to write shows together. Mm -hmm. Where did this come from? This desire to write shows together. Well, they had a they had a Monon Review, they called it, named after the Monon Railroad in Indiana. So Naturally. you know, it's like the mountain. It was there. The show was there, and I think we started mm -hmm. out with um, a man involved with this. He. I think he really wanted a date with Gretchen, so he asked her to write <laughs> this musical with him, mm -hmm. or the comp to be in the competition for mm -hmm. it. And then they came to me and asked me to write the songs. So they wrote the book at that time, and I wrote the songs. The great thing is that at that our college, DePaul University, they would do this original musical every year, and teams would compete write musicals and then get chosen. Maybe three teams would compete. And so it was a very do wonderful you, creative do environment. Do you remember what the subject matter was? Oh, oh yes. yes. Oh yes. We made, we fabricated, we made a list of what we thought the elements of a good musical should be. And we came up with an idea about a princess from an East um, European country who comes to this country dressed as a man and works in a um, lumbering place yeah, because because her country had a lot of timber and she wanted to learn timber uh, because her father was <laughs> in exile but she knew someday she would be called upon to go back and take charge and so it was a love versus duty story so she was, was a princess a she was a princess, princess. musical the yes. first one was a feminist <laughs> musical <laughs> so when we were eight well she yeah mm -hmm. someone appeared a mysterious man at the end of the show and summoned her back to her country to rule there, and she had fallen in love with somebody here, but... A lumberjack. A lumberjack. A lumberjack. The foreman. Yes. And she gave <laughs> They're up chick magnets, the those they lumberjacks. Are. They, they are. are. you got to watch out. Uh, in, I don't, this is not all going to be history, mm -hmm. but I'm so thrilled with the history part that, you know, especially because I want to remind women just how short our history is, mm -hmm. you know, this is not, to be a pioneer doesn't mean, you know, you had a covered wagon. Um, Ms. Magazine in 1977 said, women looking for songs to sing on buses to go to conventions should should really listen to the two of your your albums. Now you know it's very interesting. That seems to be the way Nancy and I got pigeonholed. Yeah. But our first two shows were actually anti-war shows. Our first yeah. two professional shows in New York. Your first show were, was really about your pacifist brother, right? Yes, that's right. And then the second one, the last Sweet Days of Isaac, the whole second segment was an anti-war 
and but we never got labeled as pacifists or anti-war yeah. people. But then when mm -hmm. we wrote "I'm Getting My Act Together," we got labeled as feminists. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not a bad thing. No, it's no. not a bad thing at all. <laughs> but, but, but it is interesting, interesting because you were always doing political work. Mm -hmm. yes. And that first show, which is called, was now is the time for all good men, mm -hmm. was 1967, which mm -hmm. is was there wasn't that much being popularized about anti-war anything in 67. It was just starting, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it was a little bit dangerous. It was a little before hair. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was a little bit dangerous, mm -hmm. and uh, it was also had rock music in it, so mm -hmm. so you were pioneers in that way, too. Well, that one actually didn't have rock music, oh. and I think it was right at the end of mm -hmm. the period of time. Had it had rock music, yes. it might have done better. I don't know. It was mm -hmm. the same year as hair or earlier than hair, but we were still in kind of the Rogers and Hammerstein vein mm -hmm. at that particular time. What um, fascinates me about both The Last Sweet Days of Isaac, which was written in 70, and Shelter, which was your big Broadway show that ran mm -hmm. one a little time, <laughs> a little bit of time um, was in terms of the subject matters that, that, that they are s still so contemporary. It would seem to me that not just an anti-war subject matter, but a, a, um, in Last Sweet Days of Isaac, um, these, this couple meets in an elevator, gets stalled mm -hmm. in an elevator, and mm -hmm. he asks her the question I hope no one ever asks me, which is, uh, in the ultimate sense, tell me who you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, and then, but the second act, they're in jail, in adjoining jails mm -hmm. for anti-war pro for for war protesting, right. and but they communicate by television. Right. And your point there, I guess, is that the media was already the place where you were going to be communicating. Well, yes, and it had to do with the confusion between the image of something and the thing itself, and that technology is starting to confuse those things that we get all, we start thinking that we're going into chat rooms, for example, now. Well, we're not going into chat rooms. We're sitting in our room in front of our little computer, you know, but we, we start confusing what is the real thing with the image, and that's a lot of what Isaac was about. Which is, you know, so ahead of its time. And then also, also Shelter, which I, um, um, which sounds like um, a mo you know, one of several movies that have been made in the last several years where this guy takes up, he, he goes and lives in a TV studio that looks like a house. And he creates mm -hmm. his own environment with the help of his best friend, his computer. Now that was in 1973, and we had a, co the computer was one of the characters. The computer was named Arthur, I think, mm -hmm. and sang songs, and this guy started having a relationship with Arthur. And so people, the reaction to it was, this is bogus, that's never going to happen, is that? No, that wasn't the point of the piece. The piece is really about self-delusion and uh -huh. creating your own reality that is completely uh, apart from really, I mean, this guy was encapsulated in the TV studio, yeah. creating the weather, creating his a, entire environment. He had a tape, a cricket tape. Yeah, so it had to yeah. do with people mm -hmm. who, who live in a world of self-delusion. And I'm going to take us out of the history in a moment, but there was something that you said around that time, which is we are all so over-documented that it gets in mm -hmm. the way of living. Yeah, oh, I think that's so true You know, now. could you not have said it today? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so. Anyway, so I'm especially happy to have you both here. <laughs> um, getting, getting, um, getting my act together and taking it on the road one, eventually was done in how many countries? Oh, I don't know. Around the world, I 50, just, 100, I don't know. It was done all over. And could you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the show? Because I'm sure there are people who just who know the title. Everyone knows yeah. the title. Well, again, that was the show was a culmination of kind of a long journey, which actually both Nancy and I had gone through, coming out of a sensibility of the 50s, and then coming in through what was happening to women in the 70s, 60s and 70s. And for a long time, I know, we had been thinking about we wanted to write something about what is the journey of women and uh, didn't really know how to do it, how it wouldn't be kind of like, you know, just a, a mundane chronicle kind of thing. But at the time, Nancy and I were doing our own cabaret act and we had started writing songs that were a scrapbook of our lives, writing about 
things that had happened to us and people we knew and that sort of thing and setting it to music. And you played and piano and you sang or did sang. you you also sing now? Oh, of, yes, course. of course. So, oh, yes, yeah. I just want to make sure sure we're clear on that. Yeah, yes. and we were doing it together. Yes. We were appearing at places like the cookery. Mostly just the two of us. Sometimes mm -hmm. we'd have a bass and a guitar with us. Mostly we just performed by ourselves. By ourselves and did yeah. you have did you have um, um, a macho male chauvinist agent who wanted to no. package you? Is no, that no, 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 that wasn't, that, that was fabricated, okay. no. But what happened was, because we were writing songs that got very personal in our cabaret act, one night in the middle of the performance, I thought, I suddenly thought, while we were singing, oh, I know what we could do. We could write a show about a cabaret singer who wants to create her new act, and she wants to leave those old songs behind, and she wants to write things the way they really are. And I think we could call it, I'm getting my act together and taking it on the road. Now, this thought came while we were singing a song, and I remember <laughs> I turned around to Nancy right after and just said, I think I have the idea for our show. And then we went on singing for the rest of the evening. But um, And once we had the metaphor for it, um, that is, it was about a cabaret singer putting together her new act and having trouble with the man, who was kind of a symbolic kind of man, who uh, didn't want her to change, who preferred the old version of her. And this had to do with the kind of training that both Nancy and I had coming out of the 50s as to what a woman should be, you know, the helpmate. And, and well, when we went well, to you, college, there were only four things you could do. You'd be a secretary, a nurse, a teacher, or a wife. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nancy became a secretary. You were a secretary. You were a temp, mm -hmm. right? Very fast typist, I hear. And you, oh, went, you taught 114 school. 114 <laughs> words a minute. Even I, you have heard that. I That's don't so know. But I remember that, you know, that... <laughs> That oh, when I was growing up too, it was basically, you know, have something to fall back on. Oh yes. If your husband mm -hmm. can't make enough money, mm -hmm. and right. that was, you know, mm -hmm. make sure you know how to take shorthand and type, and mm -hmm. and maybe you could be a teacher, mm -hmm. dear. Come I dear. was a teacher. She yeah. was a secretary. Yeah. Well, we so. both worked as secretaries when mm -hmm. we were in New Haven yeah. at the Olin Matheson Chemical Corporation. While our husbands were in school, we mm -hmm. essentially were supporting them yeah. to go mm -hmm. to school. And that's where I noticed that Nancy typed 114 words a minute. She was far faster than I was. And Nancy used to get really upset when we came to New York because when we would audition for things, for some reason I felt compelled to tell people that <laughs> Nancy was face. the fastest typist Nothing in New York. Look at this. My music background only. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to have brought it up. <laughs> oh, right. I take shorthand very, very fast. Do you? Yes, I, I do. I, yes, oh I my do. God! I listen to mothers. Look, this is my Greg or Pittman? Um, <laughs> Greg. No, um, both of us. Mm -hmm. Is it true that after one of the question, question answer sessions, after one of the shows, some man said that he wanted to blow you away with a shotgun? I think that did happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, we had just remarkable reactions in the audience on these Wednesday nights where we stayed after the show to talk to the audience. We stayed with the cast. And this is 1978. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, people would engage us. You know, I mean, we had people in the audience would get into arguments with each other and couples would get into arguments sometimes they would stalk out one or the other would stalk out some people would come up and embrace us other people would wanted to blow us away with a shotgun you know that kind of thing so it was a very controversial thing at the time and, a very and you wouldn't have been in it if Joe Papp hadn't insisted? That's right, yeah. Because when we wrote it, that? we weren't thinking that at all, yeah. that either one of us would ever be in it. We weren't thinking that. Um, we went in and auditioned it for him, and right away, Joe said yes, he wanted to do it. He walked out of the room with his entourage, got onto the elevator. A moment later, the elevator doors opened, and he came walking back in and said to me, now you're going to be in this, aren't you? And I said, well, we hadn't thought of that. And he said, well, you think about it, because I think, it would, since it's somewhat autobiographical, I think it would be good to, for you to do it. And I had to think about it, because when you're in something, you know, it's, it's hard to have the objectivity, and I didn't know how much rewriting we would have to do. We ended up not having to do too much rewriting, did we, as I recall? I don't think we did. No. no we, um, in the end, we didn't have and to. And the reviews yeah. were tepid. 
Oh, <laughs> to say Tevit is <laughs> kind. Yeah. Tevit is kind. I'm just kind. That's just <laughs> what the what I reviews am. at first, but at interestingly first. enough, as the years went by and it went to Chicago and then to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. the reviews got oh. a lot better. And the show was the same show, and Gretchen mm -hmm. played it in New York and Chicago and, and Los LA. Angeles. Mm -hmm. And by the time we got to L.A., we were having standing ovations. I guess well, a friend of mine said, oh, they stand up all the time in L.A. But, <laughs> like, well, oh. but, but no, but it was a big mm -hmm. hit in Los Angeles. It even had a mm -hmm. revival there, which, yeah. is a, which it has not had in New York. That's my question. Mm -hmm. Have you mm -hmm. seen revivals? How does it hold up? Well, we haven't seen Nothing. revivals. Yeah. The revivals... Well, came a few years after it opened. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. We haven't seen a revival okay. in recent years. And would you want I it? I don't know. Be, a lot of people ask us. People ask all the time. I mean, people still come up on the street and talk about the show. And they say, when is it coming back? When are you going to do it? And it hasn't happened. I don't know if it was so much of its time that it wouldn't it wouldn't work now. Now, if it were done, I think it has to be done as a period piece because yes. it was of its time. Yeah. It has to be done that way. Mm -hmm. The emotional underpinning of the show, the issues are still the same. The sexual politics are still the same, yeah. even though it's a different context now in that women do have a lot. We have more choices now than the four that I, we named before. Yeah. And but so, there's still, you know, look yeah. at MTV. I mean, all the packaging of oh, yeah. of, of women is still oh, not yeah. irrelevant. Yes? Yes. Um, you have a show opening in the spring. Can mm -hmm. we? Let's fast forward. Mm -hmm. uh, we are taping this in November of 2006. And then in the spring of 2007, you want to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. Anne of Green Gables? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's opening in the same theater that our very first show in New York opened, which is kind of interesting, 40, exactly 40 years after our first show opened. Mm -hmm. And oh. it's now called the Lucille Lortel, but was mm -hmm. yes. the Yes, it was the Delise then. You know. mm -hmm. um, well, it's based on the book, Anne of Green Gables, and we did it for Theater Works USA. Mm -hmm. So after it finishes at the Lortel, it will go out on the road to schools across the country. And we mm -hmm. had a great time writing it. It's yeah. such a wonderful story. And the character of Anne is a wonderful character, such an eccentric, well, quirky yeah. little girl. Yeah, and, you like the wild uh, girls, right? Yeah, we <laughs> love the wild girls. That's what we all, Well, we wrote those American Girl shows, well, this too. Is what, there's this phenomenon that, um, that probably everyone in the world knows except, or in the country understands except for, except for me. Um, this, <laughs> this is something called the American Girls dolls, right? And they are... Well, dolls, but it started as a book okay. uh, collection. I mean, a collection of books. But it's a huge phenomenon, oh right? Oh, my God, yes. And you have written a musical review that's performed how many times a day in the store? Well, well on weekends, four times a day mm -hmm. um, in New York. And they have a store in Chicago and a store in Los Angeles as well. And mm -hmm. one of our shows, Circle of Friends, plays in New York, and the other two theaters have the American Girls Review in it. But you see, the the I, I really like these shows because mm -hmm. they are real shows. And the American Girls collection was conceived by Pleasant Roland. I know as, the first name Pleasant. Yes, I love that. I yeah. know. As an anti Barbie kind of concept of for little girls because she looked out there and there didn't seem to be literature that really um, provided role models for little 10-year-old girls. So basically, this series of books has to do with what it was like to be a 10-year-old girl in this country at various points in American history. And they're fictional characters for, you know, about eight different historical periods. From starting with uh, Native Clear American? back Native Americans, mm -hmm. and then a mm -hmm. Spanish uh, girl in New Mexico in, what, 1824, 1824 before, yeah. Yeah, before New Mexico. Then and a Revolutionary uh, War character, 1774. They're mm -hmm. all fours. They're always mm -hmm. just before something really big happens, a happen. big turn. And in is American the music Henry. then flavored by the period and absolutely the... I that's one of was one of the most fun parts for me because I really got to just write all different kinds of music within each show I mean it, it, the music starts out that way and it, it it kind of gets a little contemporary at times but mostly it was it's 
reminiscent of the particular period it comes from. We have 1934, wonderful character from the Depression era, so we could have that kind of... In 1864, a little girl is escaping from slavery with her mother. So it covers a number of different ethnic groups. And the wonderful thing is that always the little girls are heroes in some way. It's not you know? about what she's going to wear to the prom. Not oh, ever. Yeah. No, it's, not. Not. <laughs> it's nice to have continuity. Now yes. look back. Mm -hmm. um, there was, I believe you said about about the American Girls Review, that if there's a powerful message to today's girls that this mm -hmm. is their moment in history to shine. Um, Did I say that? Yeah, you know, somebody. I don't recall <laughs> saying that. Well, okay. <laughs> doesn't sound even like you. If, no, even if you didn't, do you think mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> oh, I definitely think that it's a great message yeah. for little girls right okay. now because it empowers them and lets them feel that they can, um, you know, they can make a contribution. Yeah. And the wonderful thing is the little girls who come see the show really do love it. And there are 55 little girls who are in the show right now because they, we have to have so many different casts in rotation since there's so many shows per week. And are there any of them teenagers and do any of them know that you're the mother of, of John Cryer? You know, I think I am known most for being the mother of John Cryer these days. <laughs> so probably they do know that. Yeah. yeah. Let's go see John Pry John John Cryer's mother's show. That's right. 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 Now, you had three kids. Yes, one of them is a kind of a foster daughter who came okay. to live with us when she was 14. And, and, and do, you, do you have children? No. Mm -mm. Uh, because I, I, I was wondering, because there's been a lot, you know, you would talk during the time about the guiltiness of being a single mother well, raising children and being in show business. Mm -hmm. um, well, I did talk about that. I didn't that. have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yes. well, it was, it was a problem. And, I bet. You know, because... Uh, well, I was a single mom from uh -huh. the time the kids were six and four on, and so um, I had to be out there working, of course, but I would have anyway, even if I hadn't had to, because I loved the work so much. But there was always the guilt factor, you know, of should I be being a stay-at-home mom? Well, I didn't have that option to be a stay-at-home mom, but um, of course, you yeah. know, when sure. you're raising kids. I mean, when I was in Chicago doing the show, my daughter quit high school <laughs> while I was out of town. Empowering yeah, women. Yes, yes that's right. Empowering women, dear. You know, don't bother me. Right. right. Well, my daughter mm -hmm. went oh, upon her own path. Oh, I do remember the time that oh. John said to yes. me one time in the car, I, I really love what my mother does because she's different. Like, I like the kind of boots that she wears because they <laughs> lace up and she, and she, and I really like that she has a career. So there were a couple of people doing a documentary on us, and they, they wanted to interview. I, I said, you know, you should have them interview your kids. So he's, they started to interview the kids. Do you remember <laughs> yes, this? Yes, I do. And they said, what's it like to have a mother who's in show business? Or we, oh, it's terrible because she's never home at night. She never, she's never there to cook dinner for us. And we, yes. And, not, stop, a word, stop, not a word about the boots. Huh? No, no, not a word about not the boots. Not a positive thing. Um, in the short time that we have left, I, can, can you talk a little bit about how the theater has changed? Because I am sure that yeah. <laughs> that it has. Oh, yeah. It really has changed a lot. I mean, in that now it seems to me that our sh shows, it's much harder to get things on. We got That's all of our fun. shows on rather easily to begin with, and now <laughs> we really. Well, the Eleanor have a Roosevelt show you it still is, isn't it on. still hasn't been yeah. on, right? No, 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 it is not on. Part well, it's a big cast, but but other people get shows on with yeah. big cast. Yeah, Les Mis has a big cast. Uh, yes, it does. Sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, it is much more difficult, and things seem to have to have a proven record elsewhere. Now, this is a catch twenty two because how do you get it done elsewhere? Um, that's the whole trick, and things. Seem to be workshopped to death. I mean, I think it's very difficult for any original voice to be to stay the way things are processed into, you know, just processed to death these days. Although I just saw Grey Gardens and it's mm. fantastic and totally unique, so that didn't get processed yeah. out of being. But you know, it's it's very, but very when difficult. You, when now. you were starting out, there weren't, I mean, we want to believe or we're, you know, that all these musical theater workshops mm -hmm. are progressive things that are really, you know, yeah. necessary for nurturing the talents, but you see it as sort of flattening things out. 
Uh, I don't, uh, what? We weren't in, we didn't have any. Yeah. The Music point was, at that point, producers yeah. produced, mm -hmm. and they went in and they they were attracted to certain mm -hmm. material, and then they committed to it. Now, producers don't do that. They don't, they have to see it. And if it's not all the way there in the first go round, well then, then we start the fixing process or else they drop it, one of the two. There was something about commitment. There was something about, you know, just going for it, and we're going to try to make this thing work, that really allowed, there was a strength in that position. Well, the and stakes producers were different, don't, and that's don't right. you think that it wasn't as materialistic, it dare I say It wasn't as expensive to get shows. <laughs> it wasn't as expensive yeah, it wasn't, in there. it wasn't as expensive. Yeah. Our first mm -hmm. show cost $40,000. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And that's why producers are timid these days. Yeah. But there are very few producers that see something something and say, yes. I mean, there are some, sure. but not many. And um, we have virtually no time at all, but better for women or same? <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Um, I don't think people are surprised by women doing things or wanting to do things, although they no used to ever, say, <laughs> nobody was really too surprised about us. Well, no, they used to say, did you two girls write that all by yourselves? Oh, <laughs> they did, so, they did used yeah, to say that. I don't think that goes on anymore. No, well, look, no, it there's doesn't. progress. I'm so sorry, we're out of town, a time out of town, <laughs> <laughs> out of time. Uh, Gretchen Cryer and Nancy Ford, I'm so happy to have had you both here. And thank you for joining us. On behalf of the League of Professional Theater Women, I'm Linda Weiner, and this has been Women in Theater.